Well, I'm Mike. This is the, the ice cream the ice cream van that uh, I've been offered you drinks or ice cream. Uh, just here working at the golf all week. Uh, I live in England um, and then was offered the job here a couple of weeks ago and I took it. So I'm working here all week. Get to see all the golfers play. Just saw Phil Mickelson and Tom Watson's coming up. So it should be good. Keep running through my head As I walk this road with nothing ahead The sun beams down on my face As I walk this road that leads to amazing grace I was invited to go to St. Andrew, Scotland with DJ Gregory. DJ Gregory is the founder of Walking for Kids Foundation. DJ has cerebral palsy and he walks every PGA Tour event and raises money for children's charities and hospitals. Here we are in Scotland. We've arrived in Edinburgh. And I got Roy here, my driver. Thank you, Roy, for driving me up to St. Andrews. You're welcome, Tom. And so I arrived in St. Andrews a few days ahead of DJ to do some filming for Road In Between. So why is it called St. Andrews? Who was St. Andrew? St. Andrew was the apostle of Jesus and his brother was Simon Peter. He was the one who introduced Simon Peter to Jesus. Andrew would be crucified and his bones were kept ever since. And those bones arrived on this land of Scotland and therefore they named it St. Andrews. Today the St. Andrew's cross is the symbol of Scotland. As time passed, St. Andrews became known for its religious centers. Everyone was Catholic. And then John Knox came on the scene. And John Knox preached a fiery sermon in Holy Trinity Church, and it brought down the house. These thieves and the fine robes, the deceived and vile this house of bear. John Knox was arrested, thrown into prison, taken down as a galley slave onto a French ship, and then was released, and he helped form the Reformation. And from the Reformation came the Presbyterian Church. Stick around, we'll be right back. John O'Neill Johnson Toyota has been serving customers for over 20 years with integrity, honesty, and value. We want to thank you, our customers, for helping us win so many awards. Now we're number one in Gulf States Toyota for market share two years in a row multiple winner of Toyota's President Award and six-time Gold Dealer recognition. And the reason is simple. Customer satisfaction is our number one priority. John O'Neill Johnson, a name you can trust. Toyota, a product you can depend on. Coming up next on The Road In Between. In today's world where most businesses and corporations main mission is to simply make profit, CRM Companies differs itself by focusing on being successful in a way that also promotes growth and prosperity in the community. CRM Companies isn't simply a commercial development and management company. They create opportunities. They create jobs. They maximize the potential for growth and development of a better community, all while still providing great services and outstanding customer relations. Learn more about CRM Companies and their mission today. Visit CRMCO.com. Welcome back to The Road In Between. St. Andrews has a population of 16,680 people and 8,000 of those are students. So we see that it really is a university town and just imagine being a student here at St. Andrews. St. Salvatore's Hall, what a place to stay. Prestigious, beautiful, monumental, incredible architecture. And look at the quad and all the flowers, the beautiful grass, and imagine Prince William and Kate meeting there for the first time. Next to St. Salvatore's Hall is St. Andrew's Castle. The Bishop's Castle of St. Andrew's was a palace, a workplace, a prison, and a fortress. The first castle was destroyed during the Wars of Independence in what seem dates mainly from 1400 to 1560 was used for the homes of medieval church leaders, powerful princes who owned large sects of land and wielded political influence. This castle was at the forefront of the Reformation movement. 
the Protestant reformer George Wisham was burned at the stake. From the castle, I went to the cathedral. And there beside the cathedral is St. Rule's Church. The twin spires remind us of the invitation to look up and to look outward. It is the, the power of religion in that land and it would shape Scotland from thence on. We are between a castle in St. Andrews and a cathedral. A castle represents power and control and walls. And a cathedral is built with the same stone and yet it is built to bring people in in order to send them out by the power of the Holy Spirit. Which one are you? Are you a castle or are you a cathedral? This is Tom Sykes for a Hush in the Rush moment in St. Andrews, Scotland. Stick around, we'll be right back. A lot of people have helped get me here. My sisters always had my back. My buddies, Sonny and Sean, the crew, pushing me to be faster. Amy reminded me to enjoy the moment. And Nationwide, who I've personally been with for 25 years. It's never been just me out there. Nationwide is on your side. Coming up next on The Road In Between. Award-winning, quality, experience. Glass Incorporated's expert team can handle single window panes to entire high-rise buildings. Whether you need storefronts, glass replacement, mirrors, or shower enclosures, no job is too big or too small. Glass Incorporated, your commercial and residential glass experts. Locations in Meridian, Foley, Alabama, and the Mississippi Gulf Coast. Welcome back to The Road In Between. This is the land of legends. Old Tom Morris and young Tom Morris, a father and son who would win this tournament many years and go on to become the greenskeeper, not only here, but elsewhere in Scotland. St. Andrews is the home of golf. You can hear the bagpipes as we walk down the sidewalk. As we approach the old course, I meet Jennifer Spears, and she introduces us to this holy land. First, it's St Andrews, the home of golf. It's a course that's a 72. It's about 7,300 yards. And as I say, it's a magical course to play. I haven't played it. It's too good for me. <laughs> but I played Carnoustie. Oh, that's tougher. <laughs> it's tougher, but it's, I think this is such an awesome course to play yes. that you feel that you know, all the greats have played here and you sort of knees knock on the first. I couldn't do it. The most famous hole is the road hole, number 17. It's the most difficult par four in the world because you have to tee it up and hit it over a wall. And it was there that I spent most of my time watching people maneuver the road hole. It is an amazing place to gather. It was there that I met a man named Angus. Angus sat behind me in the bleachers and he began to share with me what it's like to live in St. Andrews, Scotland. He's been living there for 40 years. Listen to his accent as he shares a couple of stories. Tell us about the road hole. The road us. hole is we were watching yesterday and we were watching three practicing. Uh, what's his name, the Spaniard? Uh, Jimenez or Jimenez? Jimenez. Paul Casey and a young English guy called Morrison who's coming up. Jimenez had a cracking drive over the corner. Paul Casey was second. Young Morrison put his into the hotel, so put down another ball, put it into the hotel again. So Casey came out with his driver, lined his driver up in the tees, and that's the direction he wanted to play. So he hit a cracker up the middle of the fairway. Because we were at the tee, we couldn't see what happened at the, uh, the green. But I can remember the time that Tom Watson lost the open in Ballesteros. I was marshalling at the 17th. We followed Watson up the fairway. For some reason, he played a two iron for his second shot, and he put it up against the wall, and that lost him the open. 
But as he had won it often enough before, it didn't really matter. <laughs> if you look up in the middle of the 18th fairway and okay. the first fairway, you will see people crossing the fairway. Yeah. That is an extension of a little road between the houses on our right, and it's called Granny Clark's Wind, W-I-N-D. A wind is a Scottish name for a small lane. Later in the day, I went into the merchandise tent, and it was there that we interviewed Steve. And Steve shared with us his sense of calling as a painter and how he uses a blank landscape and his sense of vision to create anew. I actually pray that, uh, that, that God would kind of touch every home that a printer whatever goes into in whatever way and uh, you know, have this lead to good things, you know, not just the financial gain for me or whatever or notoriety, but just for good things, you know, and, and we get some great stories back about how our, our work has touched people and it's, uh, it's a real, it's a blessing, you know, the, 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 the be commissioned is an honor, but uh, your stories like that is, is a blessing, so uh, um, we, uh, we just enjoy our time here, people are wonderful and we're uh, just uh, honored to be here. To, uh, I've uh, done a few major championships back in the States, about 25 to be exact, and so uh, this is my second Open Championship. And if you're a golfer and you're, you're painting the home of golf, uh, uh, the iconic scene of uh, the Swilkin Bridge, it doesn't get much better than that, on, at least on this earth. So You're right. Yeah. Well, tell us about the Swilkin Bridge. What it kind of, I wonder why it's such an icon. Yeah, it's, it's uh, some great people have walked across that bridge and uh, Bobby Jones uh, uh, was stim stimulated to, to build Augusta National by what he had experienced here. He wanted, he wanted to just build something just uh, very strong and creative. And if you ever saw photographs of uh, Augusta National in its early years, it's not manicured the way it is now. It was uh, rough, grasses, just very different. But if you go to Augusta National, the grass that you see here is about the same cut. It looks like a putting green, with only a little bit longer. It's not the traditional bluegrass that you uh, or uh, uh, bent grass that you see uh, in the states. It, it's, uh, it, it, your ball will roll to the end of the earth, it seems, on some of these uh, some of these fairways. So that and that's Lynx style golf. So, well, your gift as an artist. How, when did you sense that maybe it was your calling? Um, well, I sensed it, I guess, that about five years old when we go to the library and the only books I wanted to take out were how to draw books. And brought them home and just practiced. And show me this fish symbol again on, yeah, on this. The fish, fish symbol appears on, on uh, every, uh, every painting I do. Um, Might be easier to see. Yeah, on the original there, but you, I think it, you can focus in on that. Yes. And sometimes it leads to conversation and I just say, you know, <clears throat> Um, there, there's uh, more to this world than just what presents itself. There's a spiritual side, and that's far more important than far more important than what we do here. And uh, so, you know, what what do they say? Uh, store up the things that are, are important. He's at Christ said, everything not, else not, gets rusty. Everything else is rusty. But, you know, it's relationships and what you do yes. for people uh, that, that really count. And we live that way our life. We try to teach our kids that too. So this, yes. this is certainly fun and, and enjoyable to do. And it, it how, us how long? How long did this take for you to paint uh, this? The average painting I do that takes about two, uh, two to three months. This one took near uh, closer to five, five, four to five months, uh, pushing six. But again, that's not day after day. Because I do paint for other tournaments, but sometimes you just need a, a, a break and you go on to it and then you come back to it. And sometimes you're letting paint dry and sometimes you're trying to figure out what the next step is. So, But it, it was a, a labor of love and there's so many buildings that they had to be accurate and that takes that takes time. You know, nothing good does it that comes without, without uh, uh, putting your time in it. So. You're so right. Well, that's what makes this course so, this image so powerful, the way the city wraps around the course. Yeah, it's just iconic, and uh, there's history in every corner, really. History in every corner. Well, thank you, Steve. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. And, and hope you Blessings in your ministry. Yeah, well, you know what? 
Dad's going to put me where he wants me to do what he wants me to do, and uh, um, I'm willing to do so. I want to introduce you to my friend Jordan McCall. Jordan played junior golf here in the United States. He is from Dundee, Scotland, which is about 20 minutes north of St. Andrews. And we became friends through the years, and he invited me to come back and spend some time with him and his girlfriend, Christine. And so we spent the day together, and he shared his sense of call as a professional golfer, as well as what it's like to live in Scotland. Yeah. Hello, Jordan. How are you doing, Tom? Good to be with you. Thank you for welcoming us to your home country. You're welcome. Glad to have you here. And you live in Dundee, is that right? I do. Just about 20 miles away from here, yeah. Fantastic. And we met years ago. Years ago, back at the NGCAA Nationals in Alabama, it was, wasn't it? 2010. That's right. And then it came over in 2012, and we played together, and you were the, at Kings, Kings Barnes. Kings Barnes, that's right, yep. And Great you're, golf course. And you're sponsored by Kings Barnes. Now you're you're on the uh, Euro Pro Tour. That's right, yep. It's one of the many tours. It's a third level tier tour, so I'm trying to work my way up and hopefully one day play in the Open Championship. Wow. Well, I hope you do. Thank you very well, much. Tell us about that, that sense of call that drew you to, to be a pro golfer. Uh, ever since I was a young kid, I always wanted to play golf. Um, and once I went out to the States, I realized that that is definitely what I want to do. Um, so I've really been pursuing that career ever since then. And you've, it's taken you from, let's see, you've been in New Mexico. New Mexico, Texas, South Carolina, and I've played golf in 16 states. So I've been around. You've been <laughs> around. And you're back now here and you're playing on the Euro Pro Tour. On the Euro Pro Tour, I've got uh, eight more events and eight weeks in a row as well. So. How about that? Now, who are your sponsors? Uh, currently, we've got Kings Barnes and Oxarone's Golf Shop in St. Andrews. Uh, they're currently helping me out for this year. So. Very good. Well, this road in between that you are on from your, your sense of call to where you are right now, what kind of motivates you to keep going? Um, the end result, I suppose, knowing that there's always a chance I can get to the, and I will get to the European Tour, it's the, the end result that keeps me interested. Um, obviously there's going to be plenty of people that are going to put you down, but as long as you have the self-belief, knowing that you'll reach your final goal, that's what keeps you going. So. And you got good friends around you? Great friends, great family, great support from all those guys, yeah. yeah. Well, we all live between uh, dreams and hopes. And, and it's that between time where really you just you discover your character and and uh, probably who, who you need to hang around with and who not to hang around with. Mm. Yeah, that positive versus negative seems to be key. Yeah, it's, it's so important to always remain positive and try and block out the negative comments or even the negative comments that you make, make yourself. You've got to stay as positive as you can even when you have a 78, you know. Versus a 60, you've also got to remember when you have a 68 that got to stay in the moment as well. Because you got to go play the next day. Exactly, exactly. That's right. Well, we're back here at St. Andrews, and uh, have you ever played this course yet? I played this course twice, uh, a couple of years ago now, yeah. Great golf course. Um, great holes to finish, obviously. Tough holes to finish. So how, how about 17 in the road hole? It's always good. I'm not sure where to hit it over the, uh, over the hotel, but... Hopefully you hit it and you find it in the fairway somewhere. So. I duck hooked it and left. I, <laughs> I was trying my best to fade it and did the opposite. Yeah, right, exactly. yeah ended up in the hay. <laughs> well, I, I thank you, Jordan, and it's great to be back here. It's been a long time, and and uh, thank you for your friendship. Thank you. And look forward to you making it. Yep, thank you very much. One day I was walking around the Spectator Village, and I looked up and I couldn't believe what I saw. The Bobby Jones story through Emory University. Growing up in Atlanta, my favorite golfer is Bobby Jones. Bobby Jones never turned pro, he remained an amateur, and he won every major golf tournament there was. His story is amazing. We met the curator, his name is Randy, and I'd like to introduce him to you, and he can share with you the story of one Bobby Jones. Randy Yu. I'm the curator of modern political and historical collections at Emory University's Manuscript, Archives, and Rare Book Library in Atlanta, Georgia. I became a historian and a curator for a very specific reason. I grew up in Atlanta and no one talked about the city's past when I was growing up. We all knew about the Civil War, but other than that, 
we didn't know anything about it. So I'm convinced my entire career, I'm old enough that I remember the old city and I remember seeing the old city, but my entire career is taking those puzzle pieces from my childhood and trying to figure out the context, what, what I saw, what it meant, and how it affects the city today. So. Um, it took me a long while to find it because, right, I knew you could study cities, but I thought you had to study places like Paris, Tokyo, New York City. It never occurred to me that anyone would be allowed to or be interested in studying a place like Atlanta. And, and your hometown. In my, my hometown, and I ended up taking a course that I didn't want to take, and it was about Atlanta, and just the light bulb clicked on like that. I was like, this is what I'm interested in. This is what I'm here to do. Welcome to Bobby Jones, The Game of Life, presented by Emory University at the Open Championship in St. Andrews, Scotland. Um, we're here today because we're trying to tell the story about Mr. Jones, who was an Atlanta businessman, attorney, and also a golfer, um, one of the greatest amateur golfers of all time. This is Bob Jones at age 13 when he won the Druid Hills Club Championship. Um, this is the man he defeated, Archer Davidson. One of the really hard things to know when you're looking at historic images is to figure out how talented people really were um, because you don't really have a measure. This photograph taught me how talented Bob Jones was. Bob Jones was 13. He was literally a boy who defeated men. Um, that is how talented he was. This, Archer Davidson was a very good golfer. But, and he had decades more experience playing golf, and more importantly, playing competitive golf. Bob Jones said there were two kinds of golf, golf golf and championship golf. And Jones was so talented that he could defeat men, men who were twice his age. And so, and we actually have the photograph, and the photograph comes from Mr. Jones in his scrapbook. At the bottom, in his boyhood handwriting, underneath Jones, it says champion, and underneath Archer Davison, it says runner-up. Oh, wow. So in 1930, Jones became the first um, golfer to win all four of the major tournaments of his time period in one year. And it became known as the Grand Slam or the imp Impregnable Quadrilateral. Um, these days, folks talk about the modern Grand Slam, but they talk about career Grand, grand Slams. No one has ever come close besides Ben Hogan and this year Jordan Spieth with the possibility of winning the four major tournaments of their time period. Jones was the first and the only one. Um, he won, came over here and in St. Andrews he won the British Amateur Championship. Then he went to Hoy Lake and won the British Open and then went to um, Interlochen in Minnesota, made a 40-foot putt on the 18th green in the last round to win the U.S. Open and then won the U.S. Amateur Championship in Marion to complete the Grand Slam. After Jones retired from competitive golf, um, he and Robert W. Woodruff, the head of the Coca-Cola Company, were traveling to Berlin in 1936 to go to the Olympics. Um, they stopped in Scotland, and after playing Glen Eagles, um, they said, why don't, we, why don't we go and play the old course? So Jones phoned up, asked for a tea time. It simply said, Robert Jones, Atlanta, Georgia. They drove down here, got here that day, and it turned out the entire town came to see Jones play around. Um, Mr. Woodruff took one look at the crowd and said, I'm not playing today, have fun. <laughs> yeah. um, but literally the entire turned out, the town turned out, they closed the stores, they put signs in the doors that said Bobby's back. Um, and so it just shows the incredible relationship he had with this town. In 1958, there was the inaugural Eisenhower Cup. Bob Jones was made the captain of the team. When he was here, this was his last visit, um, St. Andrews awarded him the freedom of the city of St. Andrews and the borough. The only other American to receive that honor was Ben Franklin when he was ambassador to France in the 1780s. Um, at this time, Mr. Jones had a terrible spinal condition called syringomyelia. Um, he couldn't walk unassisted. When the provost brought him the freedom of the city, Jones sprang to his feet and took his first unaided steps in 10 years and walked to the podium, gave his remarks, and walked back to the seat. It was just a measure of how important the moment and the award were to him. I could take out of my life everything 
accept my experiences. It's an end. And I still have a rich full life. <laughs> And he sent Mr. Woodruff, who was here with him in 1936, a postcard. It was the Royal and Ancient with the 18th Green. And it says, this time topped even the last, and the last with 1936. I wish for both of you at the freedom ceremony. So it's a very nice thing. You can also tell with his handwriting, you can tell that his spinal condition is starting to affect his handwriting, but that it was still important enough for him to handwrite a message to Mr. and Mrs. Woodruff. Um, but first and foremost, y'all might have heard of a country club he helped develop called Augusta National. They have a tournament there called the Masters. You might have heard of it. Um, so they picked the absolute worst time to create a golf course. It was in the depths of the Depression. And what people don't know is that Augusta National struggled mightily for the first decade of its existence. Um, in 1934, in order to help publicize the, uh, the club, they had the first annual invitation, uh, Augusta National Invitational Tournament. Today it's known as the Masters. Jones initially refused to call it the Masters because he thought the title was too pretentious. But eventually everyone else was using it, so he agreed to call it the Masters. And he actually played in the Masters Tournament uh, to help publicize it. People know Jones because of his golf achievements, but one of the spectacular things is that, um, as our exhibit is, the game of life. Um, Jones took the lessons that he learned from a very young age at the golf course and applied it to his life. He uh, had a degree in mechanical engineering from Georgia Tech, a uh, degree in literature from Harvard University, and then he went to Emory University and uh, went to law school there. In 1926, he became the first golfer ever to win the double, which was the U.S. Open and the British Open. Three months later, he enrolled in law school. That's a little hard to comprehend these days for a professional athlete to do something like that. Sure is, and he passed it, I think, his first year. Passed um, the bar. He went to, he, Bobby Jones did not graduate from Emory, even though he went there for law school. He, after his third or fourth quarter, he took the bar exam to see how difficult it was, and he passed it. So he didn't have to go back and complete his degree. He went to work for his father's law firm. Part of this exhibit is that it's not stuck in time. Um, Mr. Jones' legacy is still with us. Emory University has a Robert T. Jones Jr. program, and it's an exchange program with the University of St. Andrews. Well, that concludes our show here in Scotland. We hope you've enjoyed the views and the thoughts as we blended God with golf. And until we meet again, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you this day and forevermore. The Road In Between is made possible thanks to these sponsors. John O'Neill Johnson Motor Companies, Glass Incorporated, CRM Companies, Archer Architecture, Benchwarmer Grill, Benefits Management Group, Bright FX, Construction Services Incorporated, Cooper Concrete, Harvest Grill, Marcello Cranes, Mitchell Signs and Imprints, Modern Outfitters, Mississippi Beverage and Water, Nationwide Insurance with Richard Davis, Woodstock Furniture,